This is the Alpha Man Podcast. In this series, we speak to traders, investment professionals, analysts, coaches, performance experts, psychologists, scientists, and authors to try and help illuminate the meta game of trading, the game that transcends what people do within the normal boundaries of their work as traders and investment professionals to help gain greater wisdom, clarity, and insight so that they themselves can shift gear to a higher level of performance. My name is Stephen Goldstein and my co-host is Mark Randall. And today our guest is Professor Brian Keating. This podcast is produced in association with the Society of Technical Analysts, the STA, one of the world's leading bodies for the advancement of technical analysis, education and development. To find out about becoming a member and to know more about the STA, visit their website sta-uk.org. Now on with the podcast. Welcome to the Alpha Mind podcast. Today, the podcast deviates slightly from our usual type of guest in order to broaden our search for greater understanding of what contributes to outstanding human performance in financial markets. We're going to the world of science to speak to one of the world's most esteemed scientists specializing in the field of cosmology, Dr. Brian Keating. Dr. Keating is a distinguished professor of physics at the University of California, San Diego. Dr. Keating's research area is the study of the cosmic microwave background and its relationship to the origin and evolution of the universe. This project, BICEP, aim was to find evidence of what and how the universe looked like a fraction of a billionth of a second after the Big Bang explosion. As well as proposing and setting up the BICEP cosmic microwave project, Dr. Keating has received great honors. Throughout his career, he won the Presidential Early Career Award for Scientists and Engineers, the 2010 NASA Group Achievement Award, and holds multiple doctorates from several esteemed academic institutions, including Stanford and Caltech. You may be wondering why one of the world's most eminent scientists is a guest on a podcast which focuses on exploring the psychological, behavioral, and emotional aspects of trading and investing. So let me explain the link. Last year, Greg Zuckerman, a Wall Street journalist published a book, The Man Who Solved the Market, How Jim Simons Launched the Quant Revolution. In the book, there is a wonderful quote from Dr. Keating, which simply says, scientists are human, often all too human, when desire and data are in collision, evidence sometimes loses out, loses out to emotion. This is a statement which will resonate with many traders and investors. We tweeted this comment out to Dr. Keating, who connected to us with us to say thank you for the endorsement. And shortly later, we got a DM from Dr. Keating after he listened to a podcast episode where we discussed the mental challenges of trading and investing and how this unbalances people and throws out objective decision-making and good practice. He pointed out that he recognized these same effects in the world of science that he is part of, sometimes with deadly consequences which led, unfortunately, to people taking their own lives. We could go further. Trading and investing, as anyone who has tried it, is activity which gets to the very soul of a person. The highs and lows of trading trigger elevated feelings of self-worth, failure, and the associated feelings of humiliation, loss of respect, letting others down. And although these may not be quantifiable or real in our minds, they can wreak havoc with our self-esteem and can drive our behaviours, actions, moods, and states in ways which aren't in our best interests. So there are other themes that we would like and love to delve into with Dr. Keating. And we very much look forward to dipping into this world um, and really start to understand how he navigated himself through his career. So thank you, Dr. Keating. I'm sure the audience would like to hear further about you. Yes, thank you so much, Mark and Stephen, for having me on. I just want to correct one thing in the biography of me that my mother provided to you. Uh, I was very uh, love it, loving. Uh, I, I only have one doctorate, and that's from uh, Brown University, my uh, my alma mater on the East Coast. But the uh, the others are postdoctoral research uh, positions that I held at Caltech and Stanford. And the postdoc is kind of an interesting, uh, you know, almost like a purgatory for scientists. You know, it's kind of the this waiting ground before we get to be faculty, if indeed we get to be faculty now it's become kind of like the hunger games a difficulty getting to uh to actually become a professor either here in the united states or in europe it's incredibly challenging and uh, uh and the purgatory is sort of after graduate school and what do you do and 
And for me, it was a very telling uh, period of my life, uh, one in which I was, you know, kind of uh, on my own for the first time as a scientist after being under the wing of my PhD advisor, uh, Peter Timby and, and Brown University, uh, and, and then kind of let to go off on my own uh, to some extent to prove myself and to see if I have what it takes. And science is incredibly competitive. And as I said, it's become incredibly more so competitive. As even before this awful, tragic COVID-19 emergency, the uh, stakes and, and the challenges for getting a position as a as a you know kind of a, a faculty or even a scientist at a research institution was incredibly uh, challenging to, to get and it's become even more so unfortunately for my students who are entering into a job market uh, one of the things i always say is my graduate students have had about 16 of them in my uh, 20 uh, 17 years of teaching they've uh, they've all been you know employed and mainly very gainfully so and i'm, I'm fearful for the ones that are graduating into this uh, into this very awful uh, job market. Yeah, it's. I mean, it brings us straight into the coronavirus, and uh, you know, it's uh, it, it's a fascinating era. I've I've actually been following a few people, kind of from the world of systems thinking and complex thinking, who have been very vocal in talking about the spread of the coronavirus, and have actually, I, I think, been ahead of the curve for a lot of people simply because they understand this whole field of complexity and almost sort of pandemics fits into that sort of, uh, you know, and how humans behave. So it has brought me to this, this fascinating area, which I think a lot of people in financial markets could do with understanding a lot more. And I, and I wonder how that, how much that fits into your world and uh, what your understanding of that is. Yeah, I think it's brought up a lot of different elements uh, from the scientific world and, and uh, you know, that lay people and, and, and possibly even, you know, traders and, and high achievers in, in your line of work may not have encountered before this notion. I mean, just take, for example, who among, you know, the many listeners besides the technically minded knew what a logarithmic graph is or what an exponential curve is. And, and now it's like we have these on a daily basis. Scientists are used to thinking in these terms. But, you know, we don't think in these terms because human beings are wired for linear thinking. I had a chat with uh, Peter Diamandis yesterday, the famous entrepreneur and scientist and XPRIZE uh, co-founder and uh, director. And he was saying, you know, his his main kind of claim to fame is that exponential functions really dominate the human landscape, but we're just not used to uh, not used to really confronting them. And they go by so slowly at first, you know, the hockey stick curve is flat for a long time and then whoop, it goes to the knee. And that could be everything from the you know number of microprocessors on a, on a chip uh, to the, you know, the amount of uh, money printing that takes place in certain governments to, you know, you really don't notice these tiny things that that sneak up on you. And I think, you know, one of the enduring aspects of this crisis will be that we judge it in the same way that we judge, say, the financial crisis or the tragic events of 2001. It'll be a seminal event that percolated across every single aspect of life. I don't know a single aspect of life, uh, although I do know one place. I've been to the one place on Earth where there are no cases of coronavirus, and that is the South Pole, Antarctica, where my experiment bicep was located. That's the subject of my book, Losing the Nobel Prize, this experiment, what it's like to go there, uh, how uh, how I was uh, really kind of humbled to be there and, and really got the perspective of these heroes uh, from the United Kingdom, Robert Falcon Scott and, and Nor Norway, and, and how uh, they got to the South Pole 100 years before I did. And uh, it made me feel incredibly wimpy. But but now it's a hot ticket to go to the South Pole. You, you're not in quarantine. You can do whatever you want down there. There's I mean, there's 40 people there. It's the middle of, almost the middle of w winter. But uh, but it's a good place to avoid both coronavirus and to avoid, um, you know, the tax collector. I should assume it's the only place you can really go out and get cold beer right now. <laughs> A very cold one. Yeah. Um, so maybe you could tell us why you were down there, because I understand it was part of your product project, but um, um, maybe you can explain to the audience a little bit about your work and what you were doing down there. Yeah, so I'm a scientist. I'm, I'm a cosmologist, which you know some people are uh, confused with cosmetologist, and they do share that same prefix, cosmos, and that is because the word cosmos in Greek means face or appearance. 
And what I study is the appearance of the universe, the, the face that the universe presents to us, not using visible light, not using optical uh, sensory equipment that my eyes or even a, a CCD camera might be able to detect, but instead using uh, very faint emanations, microwaves that have been permeating the universe since its origin. And the question that I'm trying to answer with my colleagues and friends that work in this field is, did the universe have a singular origin? Was it, uh, was it really a unique event in the history of all time? If it was, that means that time itself had a beginning. And that's kind of strange when you think about it. When uh, you're, you're, you're um, familiar, I'm sure, at least with the, the uh, book by Stephen Hawking called The Brief History of Time, that really, you know, Stephen didn't concern himself with the origin of time. He thought that was sort of a nonsensical question to really anticipate that or to ask what happened before the beginning of time. Uh, he thought that was like uh, asking what's north when you get to the North Pole or south when you get to the South Pole. I always say north of the North Pole, every kid knows is Santa Claus. You know, he's up there in the sky above the North Pole. But, but in the context of, of you know, time itself, how can time progress when it hasn't even begun? So those are some of the mysteries that my colleagues and I are attempting to answer with technology, with really heavily advanced technology that's on one hand really driven from uh, the byproduct in some cases of uh, the great war of the previous century. This is technology invented in the UK and in the US called radar. And that radar technology led to the development of things ranging from the cell phone to the radio telescope. And I obviously use the latter. So we go to these places because, uh, not because it's you know fun to get away from it all, but because it's uh, the best place on earth uh, the two places that I that I work at, uh, the high Atacama Desert of, of northern Chile and the high planar ice plains of the South Pole, those are places that are free from atmospheric contamination, from man-made contamination. They're very dry, very high altitude. So we go there to get the most pristine glimpse of the early universe's birth pangs. The project has been a great success. It's still ongoing today. But there was some disappointment uh, that it didn't achieve exactly what it said. Yeah, yeah. I mean, oftentimes we think of science as being right, and it makes the front page of the New York Times or The Guardian or whatever, uh, and it will make this big splash, or it's uh, it's wrong. In other words, that it that it's a blunder or a mistake, um, you know, kind of as if science is a zero-sum game the way that many other things are. But in fact, you know, science isn't really uh, best depicted in that light. It should be thought of as, you know, kind of a positive sum game, but along with the, you know, the setbacks, the, 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 you know, disappointments that you get, sometimes you do get inklings of pure truth and pure facts. Uh, but most of the time you're start trying to prove yourself wrong. You're trying to say what could have possibly contaminated the data that I've collected that would have uh, obfuscated what is true and deceived me into thinking what I uh, what I wanted to believe in some sense uh, is actually uh, is actually the truth. And I make the point in the book that scientists are human beings, and despite the stereotypes to the contrary, I mean, you look at somebody like the Stephen Hawking. It's very hard to relate to somebody like him. He was such a genius, such a brilliant, inventive, creative mind, and plus with his uh, persona in the in the public imagination. He achieved a level of, of fame and, and kind of, you know, super reality that, that few, if any of us, can ever achieve. And yet, if you ask people, you know, who's name a living scientist, they would say someone like him. But he's really the, you know, the black swan. He's the, he's the exception to the rule in that he, you know, he has this incredible um, personal story and this incredible, you know, level of creativity. And, you know, I can't say that I'm as brilliant as Stephen, as Stephen Hawking. What I can say is that I can be as passionate, as curious about the universe. And what happens too often, I think, is that scientists cultivate that aura of genius uh, that is just, um, you know, it's earned in many cases. Uh, the scientists are, 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 you know, incredibly intelligent. But uh, I always point out the word science means, uh, derives from the Latin word, uh, scientia, which means which means knowledge. It doesn't mean wisdom. And so I think trying to develop wisdom, which is uh, which is part and parcel of understanding when you're wrong and how not to be wrong, 
that is, uh, that's a challenge for scientists. I think we all struggle with that. So what happened with BICEP, the experiment I created, and then, uh, and then BICEP2, which is a successor to it, we set out to measure these uh, reverberations that would have indicated that essentially the time and, and space had a singular beginning that began from essentially as close as we could possibly conceive of as a singularity, as an infinity in space and time, uh, kind of almost, almost unimaginable properties of this epoch, and that's called inflation. And scientists have been wondering and trying to prove this for decades, ever since the Big Bang itself was coined by, uh, by Fred Hoyle, a British uh, scientist of incredible renown. And he coined it in a pejorative sense because he said it's, it's, it's ludicrous to think about time having a beginning uh, because, you know, it has all sorts of other unintended consequences, such as uh, really kind of hearkening to a supernatural creator, a god, if you will, an omnipotent, omniscient designer of the universe. And that was completely anathema to him. He was a huge secular uh, humanist, atheist. Now uh, we call them uh, secular humanists more, more typically today. But he coined that term Big Bang. You guys are Brits, so you guys can tell me, you know, it was a pejorative uh, for something that we probably don't want to say in a, in a you know, potentially uh, open mic. But, but, but the bottom line is he was very derisive of this model wherein time had a beginning, space had a beginning. So uh, we were trying to prove that. So the stakes were incredibly high. We wanted to prove it in a sense. I certainly wanted to prove it for two reasons. One, the intellectual pursuit of it. And two, the desire that I had, quite frankly, to win a Nobel Prize. And that is the coin of the realm. That is the most... Um, you know, that is the most prestigious accolade in human history, I contend, uh, that dwarfs anything else and, and in, in, in so doing has become as close to a monopoly as is legally allowed to exist in the, in the free world. <laughs> There's nothing else like it. No, it's quite incredible. I think um, the, the sense of curiosity that one needs um, it, it, in this space of discovery and understanding that discovery never ends. Um, and that there's always something beyond the beyond. Um, I was lucky enough to be present when Stephen Hawking was on stage uh, at the um, it was the the showing of Interstellar at the Royal Albert Hall in London. Um, when when he spoke through his method, but you could have heard a pin drop in this place. The respect was ridiculous, but you had this sense of the the thought process that was behind it. And of course, in in markets, I think. To, to, to understand that we are not singular, as it were, that we are more than just us and that, you know, that we are part of something much, much bigger is a very, very important lesson. Uh, and that um, certainly within markets and liken it to the way science evolves is that, yeah, don't, don't assume you know everything. Biases that scientists have, you know, are, are just like any other human being. Why would you expect us to be any different? We have confirmation bias, authority bias, et cetera. I, I, yes, and, and that was the quote which I took from Greg Zuckerman's book. Um, and, and again, if I could just read it out, because it, it literally leapt off the page at me when I saw it. Uh, and, and I think every trader or investor or anyone who's working in any similar field, really, will, will, will relate to this. And the quote is, scientists are human, often all too human. When desire and data are in collision, evidence sometimes loses out to emotion and, and and you kind of refer to that that you know that desire to prove something right that desire to win the accolade which you know we, we all have a purpose and a reason you know we we all want to be recognized for achieving something so we, we're human and i you know i don't apologize to it i say to people you know when I, when i work with people in the markets you know on the one hand suppression of ego is almost the holy grail of trading to be able to uh, make a decision without letting that come through. But on the other hand, you need an ego to drive you forward, to push forward, to take risks. Otherwise, you don't go anywhere. So there's this, there's this balance that you have to play. You can't sit there and be egoless. Otherwise, you're just an empty vessel. Yeah, exactly. I, I feel uh, the same applies in all cases to scientists. If you don't have competition, if you don't have healthy competition and, and a little bit of an ego, it's true. 
Uh, of course, maniacal egos are, are common in science, and that's that's also another stereotype, not just in science fiction movies. You know, there's always some you know supervillain scientist whose who's, uh, ego has gone out of control. But but in ordinary everyday life, that we have this desire to see patterns, and it's intimately connected with with our sense of identity. Um, and and I like to kind of make the analogy that you know what you do when we say like what do you do or you know um, to somebody when we meet them we're really the first thing that they that they say is their job typically they'll say what their job is and you know we can debate is that really the essence of a, of a man or a woman um, but you know that's kind of what they do for their living but but it's not who they are and yet they do identify it with themselves as their personality as their defining trait almost more than anything, like, what do I do? You could say, well, I give charity or I do uh, good deeds or whatever. But in this case, people say that. And I think for scientists, it's even more so because I think scientists really see life through a scientific lens at all times. And uh, that doesn't mean they're always right or we're always right. It just means this is a perspective, a worldview that we look at the world through and sometimes convince ourselves that we aren't driven by emotion. If you ask any scientist, you know, they'll usually say, ah, I don't really, you know, uh, play heat, pay heed to emotion. I'm purely rational. Um, you know, many scientists will agree with that statement. But I, I think it's um, I think it cultivates this this misapprehension that scientists are these kind of walking Wikipedias who just make all these judgments, um, you know, from uh, from just logical principles and nothing else. I think it does a disservice, too, because it means that a child will look up and say, I'm not Einstein. Or, you know, what if I said, I'm not Stephen Hawking, I'll never be Stephen Hawking, when I read his book in 1989, and I couldn't understand it uh, in any, any, any way back then. Uh, and what if I said, I'll never be as smart as him, and I don't, didn't go into science, and I went into some, some you know, practice of ill repute, like trading. No, I'm just kidding. I, I love traders. And... <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, that actually brings me on a little bit. I mean, I... I... I, I did want to sort of talk about that idea of ego and confirmation bias. Mm -hmm. um, I, th I think they're a little bit implicit in what we've said. That point you made about scientists being all too human, you know, that that's something that we notice in the world of trading as well. You know, traders like to think they're scientific and they're led by the data. Mm -hmm. And yet it's our emotion and almost how we select the data we want, which is what stands out. And then yeah. there's that collision between, I think, between objectivity and subjectivity. It's, it's impossible to be purely objective. Obviously, the closer you can get to that, um, the better you're able to make, a, I would say, a good choice. Um, yeah. And we know that, you know, in, in science, as you said, you're always trying to, disprove the theory that you're trying to prove yeah it's it's the confirmation bias i think is the most deadly dangerous of biases that that scientists will often succumb to and i think you know taking it one level deeper in trading or whatever there's this huge motivation <clears throat> as i understand it uh to you know to exploit minimal types of advantages i mean it's rare you're going to have some huge you know unless it's insider trading which you guys would never engage in uh but you know the, or any of your listeners uh but but you know you're trying to take a tiny little advantage perhaps it's purely um you know stochastic and and you only get hints at it uh via a uh, very complex models uh, but you're trying to, you know, take something very tiny and have a lever, a leverage up that that particular piece of information or model. In science, you know, we're not really, you know, competing for something like a fixed gain. Of course, there is only one true reality of life, of nature, of, of the universe, and there are many people competing it. But it's not like there's millions of people in a marketplace that that kind of is efficient in any sense. Instead, we're, you know, you can have a killer idea. And I, and I think back to the first kind of pioneer who was really a scientist, but also a businessman. And I have a great deal of, of affection for him. And I talk about him a lot in my book, Losing the Nobel Prize, is Galileo, the, the famous uh, Galileo Galilei, who didn't invent the telescope, but he did something very interesting. He, he instead of inventing the product, he invented the instruction manual. He wrote the book about the telescope, knowing that no one else could make a telescope the way that he could in the uh in the winter of 1610 in padua he knew that he could make this uniquely this invention 
that had been invented in Holland uh, maybe a year or so before. And he took that idea and basically plagiarized it in a sense, made it better, improved it, and then kept it a secret so that he could extract maximum advantage of it from both his patrons, which were the Medici family of, of Italy, and also to leverage it into scientific fame, notoriety, and influence. And that's what the currency chief amongst uh, for scientists is reputation and the currency of influence, of their ideas, of their schools of academia, of thinking. And that propagates through. And what is the ultimate conference of 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 prestige and influence it's the nobel prize there's no nothing else that's remotely close to it so i kind of draw parallels between what he did galileo and what other scientists have done throughout history um and in a way to uh, at the meta level above just the mere pursuit of knowledge which is important galileo had mundane concerns he had dowries for his sisters that he had to pay he was the sole breadwinner he had a two illegitimate daughters uh, and and the son, and uh, he had to support them and, and a laboratory and all doing that on a you know it's hard enough to do that now as a public per, you know university professor I can tell you, uh, but back then you know in the 1600s I, th- I think it was even more remarkable. So a look at his work, uh, and he had been driven by many times this desire to confirm there's that word again the so-called. Uh, Copernican theory of the universe, which was that the earth was not the center of the universe, that instead the sun was. And that is, of course, you know, what led to his eventual downfall and that it seemed to conflict with the uh, with the widely held belief by the powerful Vatican Church that the uh, earth was the center of the of the universe. Yeah, it's interesting because, I, you know, I have certain theories in, in, the, in the work I do with traders but actually, a lot of the time, although we talk about the money, the money is the prize rather than the goal. Often, mm-hmm. early people's mm-hmm. career becomes it starts off as the goal, and then it changes at some point to the prize. And really, the goal becomes to almost prove your own ego or prove your own superiority. And, right. and that people uh, are brought down by their need to prove their rightness. Mm-hmm. They're right. yeah. They're intellectually superior. Um, I, I see both Mark's nodding his head there, and you're nodding your nodding your head. Uh, you know, it, it's it, the the ego becomes all encompassing at some point, and and yeah. you know they say pride goes before a fall. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I, I feel it's very similar in science in that we look in your profession, my profession, it draws a lot of, you know, alpha, you know, type alpha, not just alpha mind, alpha R cubed, uh, but it draws the alpha personalities, male and female, uh, that are interested. They're incredibly passionate. They're incredibly curious. They have imagination. They have creativity. They want to have, and their outlet for that is their profession. It's, it's, it's what they do. It's who they are. And I think, you know, um, once you get beyond, you know, even undergraduate, you know, graduate school, certainly nobody really cares about your grades. You know, you stop caring about your grades. So how do you keep score? Uh, As you said, it could be money. It could be, it could be attribution. And and that attribution in science is our currency, our citation count. I carry that around with me in my H index. How many of my papers have been cited at least H times, um, you know, is kind of going to go next to me in my promotion file. That then goes to the university. They get to say how prestigious it is to have uh, Professor Brian Keating. Oh, they don't say that, but uh, but you know they could say that. And 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 the point is, how do they um, how do they distinguish themselves? Look, I don't teach some new physics that uh, that Harvard University hasn't discovered. I mean, we're all teaching the same thing. We're all teaching the same laws of physics. There is only one universe, uh, unless we get into the multiverse. That's a topic for another day. But in our local observable universe. There's one set of laws. That means I can only teach that one set of laws. That means UCLA or Stanford, they can only teach the same things as, as, as we can. It's not like they have special access. So it becomes a game. How do you distinguish yourself between those? So in your field, it's how do I do relative to the S&P? You know, it's a benchmark. It's a standard. And it's become all too common for people to really obsess and invest tremendous amounts of mental, emotional, spiritual energy as well as financial resources into, you know, recruiting these masthead um, scientists uh, that uh, that we're betting on to uh, to achieve these great things. And who better to bet on than someone who's won the Nobel Prize? 
Yeah. That's the ultimate past performance as predictor of future returns. <laughs> Literally. We will return to the podcast in a moment. Just a very quick word about our partner, the Society of Technical Analysts, the STA. The STA is one of the world's leading organizations which promotes and advances technical analysis education. The STA runs outstanding courses and diploma programs in association with some of the world's leading academic institutions. Their programs are written and taught by some of the leading figures in the world of technical analysis and are recognized and hugely valued by leading fund managers, investment banks, energy trading and commodity trading firms. To know more about the STA, to inquire about becoming a member and to start boosting your trading and investing education, go to sta-uk.org. Now back to the podcast. I do want to talk about the pressures of of the Nobel Prizes in particular and, and what it's like to be a scientist. Um, you know, I, I talk about in, in the book, uh, I don't want to give too much away, but a very close mentor to me who I considered worthy of a Nobel Prize, uh, whose wife later won a Nobel Prize uh, not, not too long ago, and how influential he was and how he seemed to have everything. And, uh, and then just recently in the economic sciences, uh, there's no Nobel Prize for economics, but they, there's a Nobel Memorial Prize, which is usually called the Nobel Prize in economics. And uh, there was a colleague in uh, just last year, uh, Professor Weitzman, and he said, according to his friends, uh, this is from the New York Times, that he committed suicide in part because the Nobel Prize in 2018 in economics went to two other scientists, including uh, Paul Romer and William Nordhaus. And they had done work uh, that had, um, you know, really, in his mind, perhaps depended on his work. Again, you'll never know why, what drives a human being to take his or her own life. And it's, and, and it's an infinite tragedy when this happens. But in this case, the, the, it was clear that he had left, you know, an, an inkling that this had been something, his being overlooked for this accolade had led to, had contributed to his depression. And, and knowing that what, you know, if you, if your field of study uh, wins a Nobel prize, there will never be another Nobel prize given for that exact same discovery. So he's sort of excluded for that. At least that's typically what happens. And so, uh, you know, in that case, the, the, and I, and I like to just think, well, in, in the case, let's say he won the Nobel prize, uh, what, how would that have, you know, saved him and why would that have saved him? I mean, if you take a step back, the actual name of the Nobel prize in economics is not the Nobel prize in economics. It's the Swedish central bank prize in honorary of Alfred Nobel. <laughs> and the reasons for that is they're basically, you know, chastised the Nobel family felt that, that they were being too political. Alfred Nobel never endowed that prize. It was added, you know, in 1968, uh, 70 years after Alfred Nobel's death. So um, they felt his family felt Peter Nobel felt it wasn't comporting with what he wanted. It was too political. And, uh, and so this bank, in central Sweden gives out this prize. And then because you didn't win it, it causes you to be depressed. It just seems, you know, I, I don't know, you know, if, if Barclays doesn't give you guys an award, I, I don't know if that would really hurt your, you know, self, self-esteem, but obviously it was tragic. This, this professor took his own life. And, uh, and part of my hope is that people will see the Nobel prizes for what they are. They're an earthly award given by human beings uh, who are fallible and and they shouldn't be worshipped like an idol the way that people do for things like money, fame, power, and unfortunately the Nobel Prize. At least, you know, as I say, in my case, I can only speak for myself. Yes, we're all vulnerable and fragile, ain't is an important thing to remember, right? That we get hit by different things and uh uh you know we have to manage ourselves through our journeys. So yeah, difficult. Difficult. There is this humanity behind everything that we do, whether it's sciences, you know, whether it's it's the natural sciences that we can't we can't divorce ourselves from, you know, we're, we're all too human. Yeah. And and that leads people astray. It does. It does. And I think that there is this temptation to sort of, you know, to to get this accolade, this recognition, even if it's from people that it's funny because you know, one of my colleagues has a poster on his office door. It says, I don't believe in peer review because I have no peers. And, uh, you know, it's a joke about his ego. But uh, but in reality, you know, these things are really they're determined by human beings. 
uh, and and a lot of people, if they have disdain for, you know, if they really did have disdain for the people that make these decisions, then perhaps they they shouldn't take it so seriously. I, I liken it to, you know, something that's that's uh, appealing to scientists. As I said, there are no more grades after undergraduate you know there's no more you know, scorekeeping that's in an absolute sense but people do feel like this is the ultimate a plus and in a way you know scientists oftentimes i don't want to say that they're um that they're you know maybe being dishonest with themselves because we'll say oh we don't care about money but i think we do and i think part of the prestige conferred by a nobel prize certainly leads to higher funding levels more citations and th these are all documented in my book and how uh, this this monopoly, as I called it before, is really doing things to the practice of science. Um, you almost can't hear somebody, you know, uh, give a lecture or talk about something in physics without hearing, well, this led to this discovery that won a Nobel Prize, this led to that discovery. So we're teaching history through the lens of the Nobel Prizes, when in fact, um, you know, oftentimes it's an incredibly distorted picture of reality. So, so how do you manage that? I mean, you've had situations in your life um, you've had letdowns and disappointments and you've achieved some great things as well. H how do you manage that balance? How do you maintain or are able to stay on the right path? I realized for myself that I had succumbed to, you know, uh, uh, to, to one of the gravest sins possible, which is, you know, worshiping an idol. And I didn't think it was possible until, you know, I came into contact with an actual Nobel Prize medallion. And I, and I talk about this in the book that literally has a gilded graven image of Alfred Nobel on it that you bow down to and receive from the, from the Holy King of, of Sweden, if you should happen to win a Nobel Prize. And I realized that, uh, that that wasn't what I wanted to, why I wanted to be a scientist in the first place. It, it stemmed actually out of a desire to kind of certify to, to my father, who was a great scientist, but a complicated person, as I describe in the book, and really validate my own, um, you know, pursuit of this as opposed to doing something else. You know, many scientists can do things other than, other than uh, actual science. We can do, you know, uh, a lot of things uh, in in the world besides this. But I think we sometimes want to, um, you know, compensate for for doing this. And one way to do that is to rack up these accolades and awards, and and that became sort of an obsession. So the cure for that obsession was really realizing that there's nothing wrong with the people that win it because uh, they can't actually choose it. But um, during the process of writing the book, I was asked to to nominate the winners of the Nobel Prizes. And, uh, you know, which would kind of be like, you know, you inviting me on your podcast. I invited myself on your podcast. But but uh, but you inviting me on your podcast. And I said, no, I'd rather go on, uh, you know, Adam Grant's podcast, you know, whatever. I, I don't know. And, you know, because it's more prestigious. So it felt, you know, a little bit humbling, but I treated it like a scholar, you know, should, which is to go back and look at primary sources and realize that Alfred Nobel didn't get what he was due. And, and I think that that's very painful because once you die, you know, you have no recourse from beyond the grave. So my, my wish for this was to write my own ethical will to my children, to my uh, ideological children, my graduate students. Uh, as well as my biological children. And I think, you know, doing that was cathartic and revealing. And I did uh, come to the realization that science is a great puzzle and it's a great mystery. And finding things about it have impact on things, not just in technology and, and building better uh, cell phones or, or radar stations, but but also uh, considering the grandest questions, the ultimate issues of life, including, you know, the meaning of everything there is. It takes me back to a conversation we had with um, with a trader on our podcast last week who, um, who ironically had a PhD in chemical engineering and then left that to become a, a day trader, where he talked about the importance mm -hmm. of maintaining purpose and values and getting balance. Because he said, you know, Doing trading, you're not making any contribution to the world whatsoever <laughs> in, in any way, shape, or form. So for him, he has to balance that out in other ways. Mm. Mm. Yeah, I could see that. You know, I mean, I think meaning in life is, is hard to and is, is it up to each individual to define. I do feel like scientists sometimes do confuse this notion, as I said before, of science, which means knowledge, it doesn't mean wisdom. And it, and it seems as if, you know, especially now with COVID and everything else that, you know, we're looking to the scientists tell us what to do. And, and we kind of want this and we want these scientists up on this wall to protect us. But in reality, you know, I think the, the virus has done something else. It's really revealed what matters. 
And you can ask, well, does it matter to understand if time began 13.7 billion years ago or 13.75 billion years ago? No, that doesn't necessarily matter uh, to anybody. But, you know, but the pursuit of knowledge and understanding how the universe came to be in the first place, if you don't uh, only silo that into you know, adding another decimal place, if you stop and think about well, what is your value system, what about the universe have you derived and used to attain wisdom and confer that on other people? I think that's what scientists do. I have a chart in my book that of all the PhD advisors of my PhD advisor, my PhD advisor, my, blah, 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 it goes back 17 generations, so 1500s. And I now have graduate students that have gotten graduate students. So I have, I have you know, uh, students of mine that have become professors. And so this is like 19 generations long into the 20th generation. Um, it's an awesome responsibility, and I never, for, uh, I never lose sight of the fact that the word, you know, scientist in the Russian language means someone who is taught, and that means I have an obligation to be a teacher, to be a mentor, not just with knowledge, because you can get a lot more knowledge from Wikipedia than Brian Keating will ever have, uh, but uh, but to have wisdom and to really confer that that uh, what matters most in life. Uh, are the moments that we spend out of the laboratory, or in your case, out of the trading pits, uh, and and how we use us to cultivate you know, our lives. I think there's a great link here. That maybe I can just ask Mark uh, what you're thinking about that. But there's a great link here between what we're trying to do at Alpha Mind and the way you're talking about science here, because uh, we've always believed that wisdom is possibly more important than knowledge in the markets. You know how you are is mm -hmm. more vital to success than perhaps what you know and even what you do. And and I think that's a link. Maybe, exactly. maybe Mark, you could just comment on, on what you're hearing there. Well, I think finding purpose is pretty critical for, for everyone really as, as, as well as whatever they have as a role in the, in the traditional sense as the, of the word. But I think if we're driven by purpose and that can be a, a discovery and curiosity, not just about the universe, but about ourself. And I think there are, you know, so I think we need to understand mm. ourselves in, in that. And, uh, you know, curiosity equals discovery equals curiosity. It gets ca carries on growing. Um, and I think, but ultimately, uh, it is so important, I think, particularly now with what's going on for, for all of us to, to, ha to have a purpose uh, to kind of ground ourselves. Um, and, and with that, uh, you know, when people come to you to ask for advice, you know, they see you as someone that can offer wisdom. That's a very nice feeling to have. And you're offering, you know, perhaps years of, uh, of experience to help guide somebody. And I think we all need that. We all yeah. need that kind of, type of guidance from, from those that have wisdom at the moment. Yeah, I, I, I never lose sight of the fact that um, you know, teaching is an act of love. You know, if you look at this famous Maslow's hierarchy of needs and, and you look at, well, how can I teach something to somebody? What do they need to, to learn? You know, one is a feeling of safety and security and you can't like, I'm going to teach you a lesson. You know, I mean, as much as we tr might try with our kids or something to, you know, raise our voices, uh, that's, that's ultimately, uh, ca you know, uh, counterproductive. It doesn't, people don't learn unless they feel loved and appreciated. And, and I think that that feeling of safety, that communication will be the most successful way to cultivate your values and extend those into the future and take it from me as a cosmologist. You know, the one only method that we have of time travel is to go in the future. And how do you want to program your future? I want to program it by propagating the good values that I think I've, I've cultivated. And I want those to be spread throughout the known universe and, as much as I can. On, on that front, you, you do some work with um, is it the Carl Sagan Institute. It's actually the Arthur C. Clarke Center for Human Imagination. Sir Arthur C. We're going to have on uh, Carl Sagan's daughter is coming on the show in a couple of weeks. Yeah, so we run a center which really focuses on how science, science fiction, uh, culture, uh, futurism, and even uh, free speech, academic freedom, and things like that combine to stimulate, cultivate the imagination and create a safe space for developments in, uh, in, um, in imagining and envisioning what the future will be like. So my, my role is, is really, um, you know, fairly narrow, but, but I do enjoy it. And that's, I host the podcast. I started the podcast called the Into the Impossible Podcast. And that's named after Sir Arthur C. Clarke had uh, 
three famous laws. And uh, the first one is any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. Uh, law number two was the only way to find out what is possible is to go a little bit beyond into the impossible. And so that's where the podcast name takes its, takes its uh, moniker from. And we have on uh, luminaries, uh, even a couple of Nobel Prize winners, uh, as well as uh, science fiction writers and uh, thinkers, uh, ponderers, curious puzzle solvers uh, that are achieving at the highest level. So I would uh, love it if your listeners tuned in. I have a YouTube channel where we post the episodes, and that's uh, my YouTube channel is just Dr. Brian Keating, Dr. Brian Keating, B R I A N. K-E-A-T-I-N-G, and I have a Twitter handle, Instagram, same things. And uh, I love interacting with, with people, and I love guest recommendations. I just had on my podcast, Greg Zuckerman. We talked about uh, Jim Simons and his book, uh, The Man Who Solved the Markets. And uh, before that, we had on uh, folks like Michael Shermer, a famous uh, skeptic, uh, a skeptical inquirer type guy. And uh, as I said, we're going to have we have Peter Diamandis on next week, as well as um, hopefully uh, Carl Sagan's daughter Sasha. So it's going to be an exciting. Uh, it's an exciting project for me. It's wonderful to sit down with brilliant people and get uh, a little bit of a taste of what you guys must be experiencing <laughs> right now. No, I'm just kidding. I, <laughs> we I really are, enjoy we're talking to you guys. Thinking, well, we're talking to somebody who almost won the Nobel. Prize. <laughs> Sure. <laughs> I mean, I'm a bit of a I'm a bit of a space nut, Brian. So I've been biting my tongue on the Apollo program, on the cool spot in the microwave oh, yeah. radiation, uh, you know. And crikey, yeah, that's for that's for another conversation, I think. You'll enjoy it. Yeah, I talk about that in the book, losing the Nobel Prize. How the quest to win Nobel prizes and the quest to go to places like the South Pole were identical to the quest to get to the moon first in the 1960s in terms of national prestige. But if you look at the plaque, there's a plaque in gold, engraved in gold on the side of the lunar lander with that godlike feature, a creature named Richard Nixon's signature on it. And it said that, you know, we came in peace for all mankind, you know, like beneficently for the benefit of all mankind. And that's the exact same thing that the Nobel Prizes say on them, you know, for the benefit of mankind. Uh, and so I think it's just interesting that these competitions, you know, people don't think, oh, science is competitive. Believe me, it's every bit as competitive as trading. And I think there's so many commonalities between the two different subjects. It's a delight to talk with you guys, but I hope we can do it again sometime. I've got one question. One question I have to ask you. Yeah. Do sure. you watch The Big Bang Theory? <laughs> ah, you know what? Uh, I don't watch The Big Bang Theory. And I talked to, uh, I talked to Greg Zuckerman when he was on my podcast. And I asked him if he watched the show Billions. And he said, no, it's too close to what I do. And I said, uh, yeah, that's the same reason I don't watch, uh, I don't watch The Big Bang Theory. I, I will. Someday I'll probably get into it. Well, look, this has been great. We always leave Mark to take us out because Mark's, Mark's a great closer. So, uh, Mark, do you want to just sort of uh, wrap this up? Well, you know, be curious, discover, keep trying to prove yourself wrong, I think is a, a, a big message. And it's applicable to trading as it is to, to science and gaining a sense of purpose and sticking with it. But the degree of self-management and bringing critical people with you to achieve things that seem impossible, I think, is fantastic. And the fact we've mentioned uh, Copernicus, Galileo, you know, Stephen Hawking, and, of course, Dr. Brian Keating uh, within this podcast. Excellent, guys. Thank you guys so much. I'm going to uh, relish this conversation as I'm teaching my uh, little ones. Bye, guys. Have a great time. After the podcast finished, myself and Mark carried on talking about how great it was to speak to Professor Keating and also some of the things that we got out of it that um, that uh, we found interesting. We hadn't actually realised I'd forgot to press stop on the record at that point. So actually it ended up becoming something which we thought we would add to the podcast uh, to share with you our own reflections. Um, before we do, first of all, a quick word about the Alpha Mind Trader Performance Coaching Programme. When trading, we believe it is not just the market you have to conquer, it is also yourself. The Alpha Mind Trader Performance Coaching Program helps people develop the behavioral, emotional and mental skills which lead to better and more effective risk and trading performance. This program has been delivered to traders and investment professionals across the financial markets 
over the past 10 years and has led to significant performance improvements and far greater returns. This program can be seen as an investment in yourself. To find out more, go to the website alphaarcubed.com. That's the word alpha, the letter R and the word cubed.com. Or visit the Alpha Mind blog page and go to the link at the top of the page or email info at alphaarcubed.com. And now this is the part of the podcast where myself and Mark carried on talking after Professor Keating had left the podcast. What a great chat with Brian. You know, I think the, um, the, the this concept of curiosity, discovery, and keep on being curious, but on that journey, just uh, it, it, it's a good rule. It appears to be a good rule, certainly in science, to constantly ask yourself, Am I right? And, you know, is there an opposite view that proves I'm totally wrong? So if you're trading, you know, if you're long in the market, to constantly look out for reasons to be short. I don't know what you think about that from your own experience. Yeah, well, I mean, from my own experience, um, I, I had a big, I suppose you could say an awakening with confirmation bias somewhere around half halfway through my own trading career. Um, until then, I uh, I found myself becoming very attached to certain views in the market, certain trading views. I always think you're right type of thing, yeah? I'm right, I'm right, I'm right. Yeah, yeah, right. absolutely. And then trying to prove myself right. So yeah. looking for confirming evidence. Um, I, I, I would find myself going towards articles or analysts or, or, or fellow traders who I knew shared my view. And really, that was a very, very dangerous. It, it took me down some really dark places. Is that in theory um, a bit like if you've got, got a position on with a tight stop, but you then keep moving the stop because you keep on thinking you're right and you end up doubling up rather than stopping out, that type of... Yeah, it's it's, it's very closely fact, connected to that. You know, that. That can happen. That that never happened to me. But what did happen to me was this... I, I would say I, I would be stopped out of it, but then I would enter it again. Because I was so sure that I was right mm -hmm. that I got out and I thought I knew I was right. This is stupid, and I'd go back in. I'd commit, I'd commit bad money or good money after bad, and, and it would just build up um, rather than closing that off. And then I, I remember, and I think it was an article I read by James Montier, which talked about really behavioural finance and and went into quite some depth about confirmation bias. And I'm thinking, this is what I've been doing all my career. And, and I remember thinking at that point, and it was about the same time, actually, that I was doing um, I was doing an MBA in the evening. And we were learning about, we, we were doing a statistics module. And this idea of, of trying to sort of disprove a theory you had in statistics. And I was thinking, when I'm doing that and I'm reading this article about confirmation bias. And really, when I have an idea my aim should be to try and disprove it. When I have a belief about the market or a view on the market, I should be trying to disprove it. And if I, if it still stands up then, then it's probably a better idea. And in fact, it's probably going to have a higher chance of success. And, and, and that was a big change for me in my career. I did have a lot. I had some, a lot of trades like that where I worked to disprove them you know, be it a technical analysis, you know, based if it was based on technical analysis, if it was based on fundamental data or fundamental news, I would try and look at everything and turn it on its head. So whilst it also took me out of some trades that actually became winners, it took me out of some really bad trades, which would have gone horribly wrong. And, and in the end, I was left with what were good risk reward trades. So you, you built a better process out of it, basically. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. My process improved from reading something. Not you know. So you read an article, and that that changed your perspective pretty much overnight. Yeah, but you you must have had that at times where you, you've gone down a particular view. Maybe you've put a client yeah, into sure. a trade. Yeah, and and then you don't want to be wrong. You don't want to be seen to be wrong. So maybe you're you, you find your mind distorting the data to sort of prove it. Oh, well, if you're, if you're doing technical analysis, it's, it's one of the worst traits of technical analysis is, and the horror stories of people saying, you know, I'm long on the market because I've got this head and shoulder bottom. And, you know, they then, sh they then share the chart with you and you think, well, 
they're, 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 they're trying to make something out of nothing here to support their view because what they're talking about isn't there, but they believe it's there. They kind of like, you know, muddle up a few things and make a few compromises and will create uh, what, what looks like a pattern out of just a mess because their process yeah. behind the analysis is just flawed. Yeah, I, my, my technical analyst um, at Credit Suisse came up to me once. I had this, I said, look, have you seen this head and shoulders pattern? You know, te- traders love head and shoulders. Yeah, <laughs> they, they, They're often one of the worst patterns uh, to try and trade off. But she went, that's not a head and shoulders, Steve. I went, what are you talking about? And she said, uh, yeah, look, look at it, stand back. So you, you want that pattern to be right. So you see it for what it's not. Exactly. exactly. You see the pattern that you want to see. And we do that. We do that throughout life. We do that. I, can, I do that in arguments with my wife. <laughs> well, we do it with what we read as well. We, we'll read, we don't read things, we scan them. And we'll, we'll, we'll think we've read something, but we'll bias it to what we want it to say. Um, so yeah, those those things filter through into almost everything that we do. We've all got these examples of it. I mean, I mean, the the other thing is that you you end up. I mean, I I I don't know about you, but on social media, you could become very partisan about something that you don't really care about because someone attacks your ego and you want to confirm your own sense of being. <clears throat> oh wow, we're super sensitive to that. We're so. Yeah, we, we, this is where this sort of resilience is required, and the sort of dealing with negative emotional bullets, particularly if they're loaded to, to talk about you or to impact you to your heart. Um, you know, we we need some way, and there is a way through, you know, you know the, the mind fitness stuff where you can protect yourself from this layer because for many, many people, it leads on to anxiety and depression and recurrent depression, um, you know, because people are sort of criticizing you. And if you can't take criticism and you can see it in the celebrity world you know pe- people become very uh, impacted by it to the point sometimes of suicide um uh, but but as i said we're all vulnerable to this stuff um and and sometimes we can't get away from it and if we start to dwell on it and you know take it to bed with us and live with it as sort of a normal state of being under and everything that comes as a negative just adds to it, then it leads to quite a dark place for a lot of people. So, uh... One other thing which was related to what Dr. Keating was saying, which is, again, related to this confirmation bias and this sense of ego, that between the two of them, he spoke about the importance of curiosity. That is kind of, you know, the essence of science, curiosity. Um, and he also referred to trading, you know, your people who... Great ideas in trading come from being curious, being open to what the market is telling you, being open to other people's ideas and allowing them to, you know, building upon them. Or even if you're building a system, being over to different inputs into the system. And confirmation bias, protection of ego, could close you off from being curious. It shuts you down and and, and makes your world smaller. And I think the same goes on in science as in financial markets trading. And again, I've always noticed this curiosity or this openness to different opinion as being a hallmark of many of the great traders that I've coached and, and met with in my coaching over the past over the past decade. So what in terms of being able to just cope with it? Well, it's it, it, creating, you know, allowing yourself to be curious. And, and part of that is not allowing your ego to get in the way so that rather than believing you're right, yeah. you're actually saying, well, maybe I'm wrong. What, the, what is the other side of the story? Maybe that person's point is valid. I, I always remember years ago when I first started working with a futures broker, I was coaching a futures broker who, who happened to be my futures broker. And uh, part of the work we did was getting him to go out and get feedback from his clients. And a lot of these clients were were, were senior traders in hedge funds. And, and, and one of the things that came back indirectly from that process was him saying to me, you know, these guys really value what I'm saying. You know, I've always held them on a bit of a, a pedestal, but actually they admit that they don't know as much as they think they know. 
So they are open to experience and alternative opinions. And, and that's what makes them such good traders, rather than being dogmatic about the markets going up, the markets going down, the spreads widening. You know, they're, they're willing to be flexible, to admit they're wrong, to admit they don't know, to take other people's mm -hmm. ideas. And almost that was their genius. No, I think, but, but, but if you start to criticise those type of people, for example, if you do like a 360 degree feedback, and and there's there's a they're open to it that that that's it you know, so you know, they, I, they they can absorb it no? yeah in one of the most you know when i was coaching a team once at a bank and i was giving psychometric feedback to this team and and the manager of the team just stopped everything and he went i've realized the problem here in this team it's me <laughs> and i just thought that was brilliant this yeah. is what we need with these people they are they're aware of their fallibility and they're willing to admit it and put their hand up. And it, it, it's almost a hallmark of some of the, you know, some of the great. Well, it's a strength, an absolute strength to have yeah. that, that, that ability. Uh, know that you're not perfect and, <laughs> and you can take knocks. Yes. It's, it's yes. the same with sportsmen. Yeah. I mean, but, but, yeah. The, but there, there is um, <clears throat> much sense in, actually managing your channels though as well so so you know you may want to switch off some things that you think are going to be bothering you if it's a constant stream coming out of a particular commentator then you know we sit we see it in the real world people, people block you know you, you block someone or, or, or on your social media because actually they're becoming too much of a a, a negative flow for you to cope with so you need to put some common sense around it too, because I'm sure at some level there are some things that you could tell anybody, particularly if they appear to be resilient, that yeah. will actually really affect them. You know? Definitely, there's going to be people who are toxic and opinions that are toxic, and you yeah, have yeah, yeah. the skill of filtering those out. But you, you just you just reminded me when you said about sports people. I, I love that Michael Jordan quote. Mm, absolutely, yeah. You know, I've missed more than 9,000 shots in my career. That one, yeah. that is the sort of humility a lot of these great performers have. You know, it, it's not that, I, you know, I, I, I'm great all, all the time. But actually, I'm fallible and I'm human. And I think that almost was some of the things that... Uh, well, it's very protective because if you actually uh, disclose that weakness to others yourself, actually you almost prevent others appro attacking you for that weakness you so humanize it yeah you've humanized it and you said look i can cope with, uh, yeah i know i'm fallible i've got these weak points but let's just move on and i think yeah. that's uh, that's a strength and it gives yeah. you a, a, a position of strength yeah uh, but at least you're admitting that you're not perfect listen this is a great great little chat after the end of this podcast that um that dr keating has inspired um, I, I hope the listeners, the audience, have uh, <laughs> have enjoyed it, um, and uh, I hope they've got something a little bit more out of this. Imagination. So his podcast is into the impossible. Uh, his book is losing the Nobel Prize. As we once again say, we hope you have enjoyed this, and be sure to tune in to our next episode next week. Good luck, guys. Stay safe. Thank you to our partner, the Society of Technical Analysts, the STA. If you are serious about learning about technical analysis and being part of a community interested in technical analysis, becoming a member of the STA is the way forward. Go to sta-uk.org to know more about becoming a member and also learning about their outstanding training and education courses, programs and diplomas. If you have enjoyed this podcast, we would be delighted if you could rate and review the show on iTunes or whichever service you are listening on. The Alphamine podcast is a joint collaboration between myself, Stephen Goldstein of Alpha R Cube Limited, and my co-host, Mark Randall of the Mark Randall Consultancy. The Mark Randall Consultancy offers leading mindfulness and mind fitness programs, training and development services to corporates and individuals right up to board level at some of the world's leading organization and trading and investment businesses. To find out more about the weaponizing of the mind, go to markrandallconsultancy.com or email ceo at markrandallconsultancy.com. 
thank you once again for tuning in. As a reminder, you can connect to us or follow us on Twitter at AlphaMind101 and at AlphaMind102, LinkedIn, where we have the AlphaMind group, or just connect with me, Stephen Goldstein, and Mark Randall. Or visit our page, alpha-mind.net, and the AlphaMind blog. Thank you once again. Have a good week and stay safe.